to historians, the sinking of U-534 marked the end of the Second World War. To the crew of the U-boat and the men of the Liberator bomber that sank it, it was a matter of life and death. To the Royal Air Force, it was the concluding chapter in the Battle of the Atlantic. They were silent shadows, death from the deep darkness. They hunted in packs in a relentless war that could have changed the world map dramatically. Convoys proved to be the best way to protect the many ships crossing the Atlantic. But it seemed as if the German U-boats would strangle Britain's vital lifelines to her allies. The Allied losses were enormous. Thousands of ships, millions of tonnage were sunk by these ferocious hunters. But the hunter soon became the hunted, as efficient radar technology and long-range aircraft changed the odds. The German Navy also suffered tremendously. 75% of U-boat personnel died in action, a percentage unequaled anywhere else in warfare. War is never fair, but how strange that a German loss of 30,246 men equaled the loss of 30,248 crewmen of the British Merchant Marine. The Third Reich crumbled, but even with German defeat clear for all to see, U-boats were still a dark, evil factor fighting to the very last moment. The U-boats were also the final way out of Germany, a last escape route for the leading elite to carry their visions of a Nazi ideology to South America. Many U-boats and their cargoes didn't make it. The myths and stories have obsessed wreck hunters since the war. The most powerful icon of them all was U-534. It was the last U-boat to leave Kiel before the war ended. It was said to carry important documents, valuables, even high-ranking Nazis. But was this true? Owe Jensen, diver, adventurer and treasure hunter, had been tracking U-534 for more than 30 years. But it was an extremely difficult task. Endless research had revealed that U-534 had a strange pattern of activity and many rumors would be confirmed. U-534 was a Type 9 C-40, one of the larger ocean-going units. With a range of 11,400 nautical miles, it was capable of operating for several months, sailing as far as Japan for special cargoes. Launched in December 1942, it was used for training and the testing of new weapons. But it was soon transferred from regular duty to a flotilla directly under the control of the Nazi leadership and used for secret missions. In 1944, just before the Allied invasion, it was the last U-boat to leave Bordeaux. It was also the last U-boat to leave Stettin in Poland in March 1945, before the Russians moved in. It had spent four and a half months in a shipyard, very unusual for a trivial repair that should have been completed in a matter of days. Owe Jensen found a drawing made by one of the crew which indicated that something special had been brought on board. Everything pointed to the fact that there was something very unusual about U-534. Arnholt is a small island in the Kattegat between Denmark and Sweden. It's right next to the routes travelled by the German U-boats. For years it has been Owe Jensen's base during his search for U-534. Even though he was sure of its rough location, it was hard to be exact. There were almost a hundred U-boat wrecks in Danish waters, and many conflicting reports. Of all the German U-boats from World War II, only U-534 and two others had still not been located. Owa stubbornly returned to the same area, and finally, in 1986, he and his team made a positive identification. Bedreed het Rijk van de meest gevreesde roofdieren op aarde. Er op uit om te doden zonder genade. Ze kennen geen angst, medelijden of spijt. Dit zijn de dodelijkste jagers ter wereld. Maar waar komt dat killer instinct vandaan? In een nieuwe serie op National Geographic Channel kunt u van dichtbij meemaken hoe ze toeslaan.
daar versteld van de tactiek die ze gebruiken. Dit zijn bloeddorstige roofdieren. Build for the Kill, vanavond om 8 uur op National Geographic Channel. What makes these amongst the best pop songs ever recorded? They are electro pop songs. Mega hits with a synthesizer driven energy that makes them instantly recognizable and timeless. You can't buy them anymore as singles, but at last these are all available on one collection, called Electro Pop. That's 60 of the best electro hits on four CDs or cassettes, nearly four hours worth. But you can't buy Electro Pop in any shop. You have to order by phone. To get your copy, call now. Insight. We know great music when we hear it. I cover their eyes to keep them from thrashing around. For my own safety, I tie their legs behind their back. Tape their mouths to stop them from biting me. Oh my god. Maak elke week een afspraak met Dr. Brady Barr. Onze krokodillen expert. Crocodile Chronicles. Elke woensdag om half tien. The U-boat had settled at almost 70 meters in one of the deepest crevices of the Kattegat. It was covered by mud, rubble, nets and stones. It was impossible to enter the U-boat as it lay. Thoughts of hidden treasures tantalized the divers. But the U-boat still held on to its secrets. It had to be raised to the surface. But who would pay for such an ambitious operation? Owe Jensen needed a collaborator, preferably somebody with the same obsessive streak and enough money to support the costly and complicated project. In Carsten Ree, he found a very unorthodox businessman, a publisher and entrepreneur with a stubborn will of his own. Carsten Ree picked up the multi-million dollar challenge, but he faced awesome practical difficulties. And then there were the politics and diplomacy of raising a U-boat. The German authorities regarded this as a war grave, it shouldn't be disturbed. But this only fed the rumors. What were they trying to hide? Then there were the ecological concerns and the potential danger to shipping. The U-boat was packed with who knows how many tons of unexploded ordnance. What if it detonated during the operation? But eventually, the Danish Ministry of Defense cut through all the red tape and gave permission to commence the mission. Carsten Rie had commissioned the Dutch salvage company Smittark to bring U-534 to the surface. They mobilized a team of 80, including sailors, blacksmiths, engineers, and deep sea divers. This was Carsten Rie's first direct view of the U-boat, prompting many thoughts about what kind of challenge it would be. Smittark understood this challenge. They had 30 days to raise and secure the U-boat.
The Arnhold ferry arrived with some unusual passengers. 14 survivors from U-534 and seven of the Allied crew of the Liberator bomber. Carsten Rhee invited them all to meet for the first time. They came from Germany, Great Britain, USA, Canada and Australia. They would spend the next three weeks remembering and exchanging stories while anticipating the confrontation with their common past. U-boats uh, yeah. have been, been uh, uh, brought to the surface, but I don't know whether the crew that sank the uh, U-boat has been there to witness it. So you've got that sense of uniqueness. For me, it's a beautiful experience or rather, a moving experience. Even now, I don't think it's really sunk in, and I don't think it will until I see it on the top. At first, they all mixed easily. They seemed keen to share their experiences. But there were shadows. Beneath the polite surface were troubling memories and unanswered questions. There has been a little problem. But I think this has been resolved. And uh, as one uh, veteran meeting another, yes, I think it's going to be exciting. In the following days, the two groups of veterans kept apart from each other. The Allied crewmen never forgot that another bomber in their mission had been shot down by the guns of the 534. There was only one survivor. 10, 12, 44, age 24 years. He lost their lives in this area, eh? Canadian. The Liberator crew had witnessed him being pulled into a German rescue boat. Yet when that boat arrived on shore, the rescued airman was dead. The still unanswered questions about their comrade's death added tension to the visit. A model U-boat stirred up memories that most of the Germans thought they'd buried of the day they'd escaped from a sinking U-boat as water rushed in. Three of them didn't make it. They'd received orders to surrender, or to go to Norway, where the Germans still hadn't capitulated. But instead, the German sailors shot down the Allied liberator, inviting retaliation. To this day, nobody knows why. There were still many unanswered questions. Piecing the story together was not easy. <laughs> The survivors from both sides were getting caught up in the salvage adventure. But when they went out to the platform, it was in separate boats, Germans and Allies keeping well apart. The German visitors had plenty of time to contemplate what would surface. Only their captain Nollau had known the contents of the U-boat and its final destination. But Nollau had committed suicide after the war. The Germans found the Dutch salvage team facing new problems. Freeing the U-boat was much more difficult than expected. It was necessary to remove all the tons of compacted sand, clay and mud to loop wires under and around the U-boat to get a firm hold of it. An airlift, a kind of giant underwater vacuum cleaner, was activated to sort out the problems on the sea bottom. Cleaning the U-boat was only one of the problems facing the salvage team. Deep below the huge platform were dangers that could blow the project literally out of the water. Tons of torpedo explosive undisturbed for half a century. The U-534 was still carrying 200 tons of fuel. If this started to leak, the Danish authorities had insisted that the environmental consequences would be an unacceptable price to pay for the raising of the U-boat. While the salvage team struggled with their delicate task, the veterans started to recall the events that last brought them to the Kattegat 50 years before. It was so obvious that the war was over, but of course we couldn't say it aloud. Unsere Jäger rasen heran. Ein Bolschewik stürzt ab. Der Fallschirm des Piloten hat sich verfangen. In May 1945, the Germans were fighting a losing battle on all fronts. They didn't yet know that Hitler had killed himself and Gross Admiral Dönitz was now the new leader. Soldiers and seamen kept fighting on. 
though they knew it was futile. They could tell it was the end, even as their leaders insisted otherwise. The Grenadier Bataillon heben sich aus den Gräben. In einzelnen Stoßgruppen. Wir haben eine Karte gehabt. We made up a map and shaded the advancing Eastern Front red, and those coming from the West, we shaded blue. And what was left in the middle, that was our Germany. The U-boat weapon was Dönitz's last threat to the Allies. U-534 was ordered to Kiel in northern Germany, where the German High Command had its headquarters. Here. In the last Nazi stronghold, the U-boat spent three weeks under heavy protection, waiting for someone or something before it could leave on the night of May the 2nd, 1945. The last U-boat to leave Kiel, destination unknown. In the harbor outside Warnemunde, there were about 20 of the most modern U-boats that there were at that time types 23 and 26. Some had more, some had less fuel, and so we eked out what we could to fill our fuel tanks. We continued on our journey the way we were ordered. We didn't know our destination. You could only see where the nose of the U-boat was pointing. The radio messages came, Danish waters, ceasefire, Norwegian waters, no ceasefire. Our boats were supposed to go to the nearest harbour. We hadn't, and we had to face the consequences. The German capitulation in most of Europe changed Allied strategy. RAF operations were now to be concentrated on the North Sea and the waters still accessible to German U-boats. The RAF had units all over Great Britain. Squadron 86 was based in Tain in northern Scotland and routinely patrolled the North Atlantic. G for George 86, like so many of the Liberators, had a crew of mixed nationalities. Although the primary job of these American Liberator crews is anti-U-boat patrol, they have also been active and effective in keeping the Bay of Biscay clear of German blockade runners. Many of the men saw action in the Pacific before being transferred to England, where they have replaced United States Army Air Force squadrons doing similar work. On the morning of May the 5th, G-86 was sent on patrol to the Kattegat, looking for surrendering U-boats. A pilot put it together for me. Well, if we're doing flying, we'll have to put the undercarriage up. Yes, we were advised uh, that we were to do a U-boat, anti-U-boat patrol in the Kattegat, that we would be one of the early aircraft over Denmark, and uh, <clears throat> that we would possibly see U-boats. High-ranking Nazis were escaped, intended to escape from uh, Germany, and... Uh, take with them uh, uh, goods that would enable them to set up and establish themselves in Argentina. And if we sighted any U-boat there, we were to uh, signal halt to them, and if they complied to show they were giving the game away, well then we would leave them. The crew on the barge was still trying to catch up with the schedule. The next stage demanded heavy gear to place U-534 in a cradle of lifting plates, three sets each, 80 metres long, two wide. Bare cable would cut into the steel. This was the crucial part, for even with the most thorough planning, there are always unknown factors in deep sea salvage. We lifted the bow of the uh, submarine, about two metres from uh, the seabed, and uh, the next step is that we will wait for half an hour to let the, the sea wash, let's say, the silt from the submarine, from underneath, and afterwards we'll put the submarine back onto the seabed, and then we start uh, airlifting for the second lifting set. The work was continued during the night. Smittak was making good progress. One never knows when the weather will permit.
unmittelbar nachdem wir im Groß, durch den großen Belt durch waren und in die After we had sailed up through the great belt and into the Katgat, far in front of us, we spotted a plane on the horizon. It could have been a Sunderland. It flew and was gone. Flog und war weg. Das war gegen. This was around 11, and then again at 12, and finally at 1. Um 12 genau derselbe, um 1 genau derselbe. Of course, we were always squashed together in a very tight space, always with the same people. You just had to get used to it. Then was Schallplatte music angesagt. To pass the time, we played music. Men could make requests. One wanted to hear Lili Marlena. Another wanted another hit. I call it a hit. Back then we'd called it a Schlager. It was a kind of request show. Then we trooped out a briefing uh, to the plane. I think it was about nine o'clock in the morning, a little overcast. A normal Scottish day, I would say. And uh, then an uneventful flight all the way across the North Sea to Denmark. When we arrived into the Kattegat, we just circled around for a while. And uh, down from the north came uh, three torpedo boats. This is my recollection and they were lying astern. And uh, as soon as they spotted us, they formed a triangle, which means they had us covered from all sides. But we were a U-boat specialist, and so we carried on. The radar operator uh, reported that he had a contact, and uh, the skipper, of course, uh, decided to go and have a look at the, what the contact was. It was forbidden for us to fire, but if we were attacked, we would defend ourselves, and we were all determined. Verhalen die je nooit vergeet. Frontline Diaries, binnenkort op National Geographic Channel. Water, mijn passie. Steeds als ik oog in oog sta met het water, reist de vraag... Wie is er sterker? Het water? Of ik? Kan ik nog betere tijden neerzetten? Me nog beter voorbereiden? Dat houdt me bezig. Dat is mijn passie. Ik kies ervoor om daar al mijn tijd en energie in te steken. Net zoals ik kies voor Eneco-energie. De energieleverancier die past bij mijn manier van leven. En die net als ik bereid is om net even die extra slag te maken. Mijn energie. 
Eneco Energie. Vijftienhonderd jaar voor Christus werd Europa getroffen door een gigantische vulkaanuitbarsting. Een explosie die de loop van de geschiedenis zou veranderen en waarmee de oudste beschaving van Europa van de aardbodem werd weggevraagd. Ga mee op zoek naar de legende van Atlantis en maak kennis met de feiten in een exclusieve tweedelige documentaire The Volcano That Blew a World Away. Vervolgd zondag om 10 uur. When all the lifting plates were in place, the salvage master decided to make a first lift. He wanted to free the U-boat from the mud and move it away from its present position to shallower waters, where it would be easier to handle. But the lift was delayed. Bad weather had twisted the 10 centimeter thick wires, and it was no small task to straighten them out again. With this uh, sling arrangement, uh, we have lifted the submarine from the 62 meter water level to 24 meter level and uh, collected our anchors and sailed with the barge to a water depth of 26 meters. The U-boat was carried to its new position under Tack Crane 1, which would be joined by Tack Lift 4 for the final lift. At the time of the attack, I was the radar operator and was the uh, first to sight the U-boats on the radar screen. They appeared as three blips on the screen. I informed uh, Warrant Officer Nickel, the captain of the aircraft, of their position, their distance, gave him a course to steer and uh, then homed in onto the target. And that went straight on. Da gab's immer ein Hin und Her, wer hat denn angefangen? Also ich and then all hell broke loose. They came. The Sunderland had done nothing but the four bombers attacked. They dropped their bombs and we fired back. We made our first run in over it and overshot the target, dropped six bombs, six depth charges. None of them hit. It was a dead duck, you know. It was perfect running. There's no reason for it. And I remember Nick getting on the intercom and saying, Nev, if you can't do any better than that, I'm going to send Lionel down. Well, then we made a big circle to port. And uh, this time we came in at a little bit lower height. I only set four depth charges in case I goofed to get a little to give Lionel a chance with two. And uh, we released them, I released them, and uh, waited for the bad news from the back again. But this time John Hurrell said that uh, one of them had landed right on top of the U-boat and slowly rolled off the U-boat. And when he got to the designated death, it blew up right on his U-boat. And there came a ziemlich derber Schlag wieder from the bomb. Then there was a big explosion and an oil pipe burst. The oil hit me on the chest. Then the officer on duty said, ready to dive, then we can't dive. And then there was a lot of commotion, and then someone shouted, we're taking on water, secure the hatches. The wireless uh, mechanic, he decided to look out the window, and he could see this uh, opportunity for a terrific uh, aerial shot. So he grabbed the camera, he asked me to hang on to him, and, uh, and he was then able to lean right out and get this terrific shot. We are high. We climbed up the ladder. I can remember it like today. Up above there was still shooting. And the people on the bridge wanted to go down. They wanted safety. And we wanted out. Below us there was water. 
She's alive. And above us there was shooting. We knocked above us. Out, out, we want out. But then it was okay. They stopped shooting and they realized the U-boat was lost. I had so many thoughts. I even remembered to put my cap on. I inflated my survival vest, I went to the port side, and they ran up to the starboard and jumped into the water. When I came out by the conning tower, the boat was already at a critical angle. And when I was in the water, I saw the stern of the boat was rising, and she went down forward. I could see the other boats clearly in the distance, and there were other comrades in the water, but it was impossible to reach them. What could I do for them? And what could they do for me? We couldn't help each other, we just kept swimming. We were totally dependent on help from others, but that help had to come. You look down there and you see the men struggling, and you think, well, my thoughts were that, you know, this had to be been peace. Those fellows might have been taking me out, and you begin to realise just how crazy war is, really. You may laugh, but my first thought was my beautiful suitcase. I wasn't afraid. I was quite sure I would get out of the water. That's where we have to go. There's a ship. And then someone asked, how far is it? I lied, I said 50 to 100 metres, that was much further. But because of that we went well, and we were some of the first to be picked up by the rescue boat. I felt relieved, and was glad that it was all over. The war was over for U-534, but not quite yet for five of its crew. During those desperate minutes in the dark, they were trapped inside the forward torpedo room until the U-boat settled at a depth of 67 meters. The pressure outside made the hatches impossible to open, so the men blew the valves and let the water in. They all made it to the surface, an extraordinary escape from that depth. But the 18-year-old radio operator Neudorfer panicked and forgot to exhale, so he glided back into the depths. 49 sailors from a total of 52 were taken on board the German lightship 101. Now the crew of the Liberator G86 could safely return to their base. Mission accomplished. Uh, I had a feeling of relief that uh, we didn't actually kill many of them. I mean, if that had been the mid middle of the Atlantic, there'd be, well, 45, 50 uh, sailors die. Yeah. I was so pleased they were alive, just as we were. We'd survived. We never ha ever had any feeling of, of uh, antagonism towards the sailors. Whenever we went out, it was a U-boat we were sinking. I mean, people might say yes, but that represents a lot of men, but to us it re represented a, a force that was the, the U-boat we were after. After half a century at the bottom of the sea, endless years of searching, months of planning, and 23 days of hard work, the waiting was finally over. survivors of the submarine and the crew of the Liberator came together to witness the climactic event. Would the U-boat surface in one piece? If the veterans experienced any tension or ill feeling, it dissipated amidst the anticipation of this amazing moment.
emotions of the veterans, the obsessions of the treasure hunter Or Jensen, and the hopes of Carsten Ree who'd made it all happen, all were now concentrated on the fate of a rusting hulk as it inched its way to the surface. At 10.45 on the morning of August 23rd, 1993, the barrels of the U-boat's 37mm guns broke the surface. A flood of memories was released as the old men watched the U-boat's emergence. There were no bodies on board, but would there still be ghosts? Owe Jensen took the moment coolly, satisfied at least that he played a major part in resolving a historical mystery. That's a typical Dutch uh, trick. <laughs> Roughly one-third of the U-boat had been buried in mud and clay, which added to its weight and made access even more difficult. But as the mud was washed away, so, it seemed, were the last vestiges of hostility between the two parties. That's it. I guess she just has a few more meters to come up and then they have to uh, remove all the explosives. One, two more. You go home tomorrow? At this point, nothing could prevent Carsten Reeve from taking possession of his prize. And Oa Jensen, in his usual understated manner, could finally board the shadow he'd been hunting for 30 years. Demolition experts from the Dutch and Danish navies went to work, led by Commander Finn Linnemann, who also represented the Danish Ministry of Defence. Thirteen torpedoes were found on board. Some had been heavily damaged by corrosion, but not those within the torpedo tubes, which is where the first exciting discovery was made. This was a highly advanced acoustic torpedo, the T-11 Zaunkönig, called the most intelligent weapon of World War II. It was able to target very specific sound patterns and hit them. Only 38 were ever manufactured, and no other examples had survived the war. Three T-11s were found on U-534 in excellent condition, a jewel for any wartime museum. But first, the sensitive work had to be done. No one had tried to disarm a T-11. Years of experience with electronics and explosives were necessary, together with a steady hand. Hundreds of rounds of ammunition for the anti-aircraft guns were secured, along with the explosives from the torpedo warheads. Eight tons of it was disposed of in an almost symbolic way.
strangely enough, Lily Marlene, sung by both sides during the war, was shared once again, though by this time in a very different atmosphere. I'm very proud as this morning entrepreneur to have the opportunity to bring you all together as friends. And uh, I can see in all your eyes that you already are friends. This marked the end of the first phase of Operation U-534, but it was also the beginning of the next, the enormous task of preparing the U-boat and its past for the future. U-534 had to be sea fastened, so it was welded to the barge for the rough two-day voyage to Hirtshals in Denmark, where a special safe dock would protect it whilst it was being emptied and inspected. Een machtig epos dat een herinnering wakker maakt die diep in ons allen verscholen ligt. Nieuwe vragen, nieuwe inzichten. This was an amazing leap for the animal world. Stap voor stap in beeld gebracht. De ontwikkeling van het leven op aarde vanaf het prille begin. The Shape of Life, binnenkort op National Geographic Channel. Tracking the European Trading Day, European Market Watch. Coverage of all the major markets, where it happens, when it happens. Real-time information, breaking news, inside insight and big players that power the market movements. An indispensable part of your business day. European Market Watch, weekdays at 1000 on CNBC. Op 8 januari 1935 wordt in het stadje Tupelo een legende geboren. Elvis Aaron Presley, the one and only king of rock and roll. Are you Time Life Music bewijst nu eer aan zijn levenswerk met een unieke CD-verzameling, The Elvis Presley Collection. Bel het nummer op uw scherm voor het speciale kennismakingsaanbod en ontvang het dubbelalbum Love Songs voor slechts 21,99 euro plus verzendkosten. Maar dat is nog niet alles. Bel nu meteen en ontvang de zeldzame en waardevolle speciale editie van de CD Aloha from Hawaii gratis. Elvis sterft veel te vroeg op slechts 42-jarige leeftijd, maar in onze harten zal hij altijd voortleven. De Presley Collection is uitsluitend verkrijgbaar bij Time Life Music. Begin met het dubbelalbum Love Songs en u ontvangt dan tevens de unieke CD Aloha from Hawaii, samen voor de eenmalige kennismakingsprijs van slechts 21,99 euro plus verzendkosten. Bel nu 0900 70 70 070. De puzzel van het leven. Komt u eruit? The Journey of Life. Binnenkort op National Geographic Channel. Archival research and the interviews with the German survivors had warned everybody that there was no reason to expect crates of gold, diamonds, or art treasures. The value was historical. The vessel was a unique time capsule. It was the first and will probably be the only U-boat to be raised and preserved, fully loaded with equipment, manuals, and personal belongings. Tons of mud and silt had to be removed. 
so several teams of workers set about their task, each supervised by conservators. The Navy's demolition experts handled ammunition and self-destruction devices hidden in the mud. They x-rayed containers suspected of having hidden compartments. There were reminders of the many questions about U-534. She carried not just one Enigma coding machine, the standard encrypting device on all U-boats, but two, and they were combined. And there were extra boxes of wheels, enabling U-534 to send and receive very complicated code patterns. Some of the survivors assisted in the emptying and cleaning process. Hasselberg made several visits and, remarkably, even found personal belongings and shadows. Here we are below, obviously. My God, my God, it's unbelievable. It's Everything's there. There's nothing here, only tins. That was my place. That's where I was. That's my blanket. I had stashed a bottle of schnapps. There's no more in it. It's been drunk. Oh, nix mehr drin hier. Hier ist ausgesoffen worden. Noch ein Bleistift. A pencil and a Pfeiler. pipe. It's been smoked. Die ist, die ist eingeraucht, du die. Siehst du? Jetzt kann ich mich wieder kämmen. Now I can comb my hair again. A dagger. In the Hitler Youth, we um, had one just like this. It goes in here. Thousands of artifacts were located, registered, and preserved. Some were in a most remarkable condition. Two tons of manuals, letters and documents are still frozen, awaiting conservation and interpretation. The task of conservation will take years. Eventually, historians will pore over the letters and logs to find clues to the U-534's real mission and the real reason that the crew chose to open fire rather than surrender. Though there was neither gold, diamonds, nor definitive evidence of possible Nazi fugitives on board, there were still many uncertainties. The U-boat had proved to be a vast source of information, but the mystery surrounding its mission, destination, and cargo remains unsolved. The U-boat was now ready for one last journey. Liverpool was the choice made by Carsten Reed. This location in northwest England has a strong historical association with the Battle of the Atlantic. Liverpool for almost all the war and was the headquarters of Western approaches. It was there and that the British battle against the U-boat sign was directed and coordinated. So there is no more fitting place and for U-534 and to have a home. U-534 is part of the historic warships collection being developed on the Merseyside in Wirral. The hull has been preserved and the conning tower has been rebuilt with original parts and new material. Like Hasselberg and other veterans, Neville Baker's returned to U-534 more than once. 
Well, level. Who the heck would like to go down there? Well, how would you well. like to live down there during the war? And they never find an empty boat. They're searching for reasons, trying to come to peace with their part in the battle of good and evil. No, no, there's, there's no, there's no, no, there's no anger. For heaven's sake, absolutely not. And that's the way it should be. The loser should see reason, and the winner mustn't gloat. That's the way I see it. Was the war worth it? Yeah. Absolutely. And I, I say that even though I two weeks ago I was in the uh, cemetery in, in Normandy. Yeah. It was worth even that. It had to be. The wars in the hearts and minds of those who fought them are very different from the wars of the traditional history books. The remains from this dark chapter of modern history have almost hypnotic fascination and effect on thousands of people, among them Oa Jensen. The sea still hides history, but it's giving up its secrets. Oa Jensen has just found the only two remaining German U-boats unaccounted for, U-1065 and U-804. There are reliable reports of valuable cargoes and fugitives, but it's an open question if they'll ever surface.